Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the University of Dundee for this, the Graduate Council's annual Discovery Lecture. In particular, I'd like to extend a warm greeting to those graduates returning to the city. Um, some of them will be recent graduates, some of you may be much older, but I hope you're returning to a happy hunting ground and uh, a scene of some of your former triumphs. <laughs> I wasn't expecting a ripple like that. <laughs> This year marks the centenary of the start of the Great War, and events such as this lecture we're going to hear tonight play a major part in our need as human beings to reflect on the earth-shattering events of 1914 to 1918. While there are some who may question the relevance of remembering and cite fears that we are in danger of slipping into celebration, I believe it is vital to memorialize the war to end all wars not just to learn its lessons, but to understand its ramifications. Although it's 100 years since the start of hostilities, it's only three years since the last old soldier died. And the aftershocks of that cataclysmic conflict are still being felt in today's world as borders and boundaries are still being redrawn. Stories of courage, sacrifice and camaraderie are legion, not just in the mud, blood and bullets of the Western Front, but in the scorched deserts of Mesopotamia, on the cold high seas, and back in Blighty on the home front. During the Great War, an astonishing 63% of eligible Dundee men served in the armed forces. That's a total of 26,400 males between the ages of 18 and 41. Now, if you're having difficulty imagining that, just imagine Dens Park totally full of people, Tannadice Park completely full of people, and the Caird Hall full. Add all that together, and you have the number of men Dundee contributed. These combatants from the city sustained a casualty rate of 15%. Put into perspective, that's double the Glasgow figure, and indeed one of the highest of any British city. By the end of four years of all-out industrial warfare, the city had lost 4,000 of its men, and there was hardly a family in Dundee left untouched by the cold hand of death. Many of those killed were lost in the 19, 1915 at the Battle of Lewes, where six battalions of the Black Watch, including Dundee Zane, the 4th Battalion, took part in deadly combat. In the city they left behind was also one of the country's most strategically important seaplane bases. And while all this was going on, the city had to continue with its everyday life, and the manufacture of jute and related products played a major part in the war effort. But despite being scarred by the loss of generation of men, the city itself remained remarkably staunch in its support for the war effort, raising huge sums in war savings and for many campaigns to buy tanks for the army. Those who came home at the end of hostilities carried the memory with them, often never sharing them for the rest of their lives. Tales are legion of the men who would die for cover if a car backfired in the street. Many had to come home and relearn basic skills. Their sacrifices must never be forgotten and their legacy always marked. I'm sure that Sir Max's lecture this evening, which tells the story of how Europe went to war in 1914, will be as entertaining as it is informative and thought-provoking. I'll now hand you over to Derek Patrick of the School of Humanities, who will introduce tonight's guest lecturer. Uh, thank you, Lord Provost. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this year's Graduate Council Annual Discovery Lecture. It's a great pleasure for me to be asked to introduce this evening's speaker, award-winning author, historian, journalist and broadcaster, Sir Max Hastings. Educated at Charterhouse and University College Oxford, which he left after a year to become a foreign correspondent, he's reported from an amazing 64 countries and 11 conflicts, most notably Vietnam and the 1982 South Atlantic War, where he was the first journalist, as I understand, to, uh, to enter Port Stanley. <clears throat> 
He was editor, then editor-in-chief of the Daily Telegraph from 1986 to 1995, and of the Evening Standard between 1996 and 2002, and in 2002 was knighted for his services to journalism. Uh, his work has appeared in every British national newspaper. Now, he's the author of some, some uh, 24 books, the majority dealing with war and conflict, and in 2008 received the Westminster Medal of the Royal United Services Institute for his lifetime contribution to military literature. Now, this evening's Discovery Lecture will cover some of the many highlights from his best-selling new book, Catastrophe, Europe Goes to War, 1914, um, which will be available in the, the foyer after the lecture. Described as magnificent and masterly, a magisterial and humane history of the First World War, Catastrophe brings perspective to our understanding of events that contributed to war in 1914 and of that first critical year, offering a, a refreshing alternative to the, the Poets' War, popularised by Joan Littlewood's musical entertainment, Oh What a Lovely War, and, and more recently, Blackadder Goes Forth, skillfully blending the, the political and, and the military. And as, as uh, the Provost mentioned, tonight's lecture is a, a timely reminder, should we need one, have you managed to escape the many documentaries and, and, and broadcasts about the Great War, that we are rapidly approaching the 100th anniversary of the outbreak of World War I, a global conflict that cast a long shadow, its legacy shaping the world in which we live today. Now, as we've heard, Dundee was absolutely no exception. Some 63% of eligible men from the city joined the colours, and 4,000 gave their lives, contributing to one of the highest casualty rates of, of any British city. And of note is the, the Fourth Black Watch, the city's own battalion. The 57% of the local territorials, Dundee's own, who were killed or wounded on the first day of the Battle of Lewes, 25th September 1915, a date still marked in Dundee's calendar. So it seems appropriate then that we should meet here tonight, this evening, in the company of one of our foremost military historians, to consider the first year of a war that had such an impact on this city. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sir Max Hastings. Lord Provost, Principal, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a tremendous pleasure and privilege to be here in this great city, in this great university again, where I had the pleasure of speaking here um, four years ago, and, um, uh, and I'd always had happy memories for me, I'm delighted to be here again, that it's very impressive to be reminded by the Lord Provost the special associations of Dundee with the First World War, and also uh, with the Battle of Lewes, because one of my own great uncles was killed at the Battle of Lewes, um, there's hardly a family in the land who don't share memories of that kind and a heritage of that kind. Every great historical event becomes shrouded in myths and legends, and a few more so than 1914, that summer whose sunlit brilliance mocked mankind by providing the setting for the first of the 20th century's huge calamities, what was then called the Great War. Those days aren't quite as distant as some suppose when we remember there are people still alive today who lived through them, albeit as children. 2014 marks the centenary of the drama which profoundly influenced the history of Europe and of Britain. I've spent the past three years writing a book describing both how the war came about and what happened on the battlefields during the first months before the fronts lapsed into stalemate. Even before the commemoration, and I use that word very advisedly, and no one but a madman would use the word celebration, is upon us. A controversy has developed about how it ought to be conducted. Michael Gove, the Education Secretary, made a plea in January that we should try to explain to a new generation why it was as right and important for Britain to fight in 1914 as in 1939. He was immediately challenged, however, by the Shadow Education Secretary, Tristram Hunt. Hunt presented himself as the spokesman for um, the liberal view that the war was everybody's fault and thus nobody's, an exercise in futility. He shares the commonly held view, although I shall argue a delusion, that the two world wars belong to different moral orders, that where 1939-45 was a good war, 1914-18 was a bad one, that the first conflict was so horrendous 
that the merits of the two sides' causes scarcely matter. The British people have always had a vivid idea of what they think happened in World War II. Until 1941, we defied the vast evil of Nazism alone. And then we defeated Hitler with a touch of help from the Red Army in the United States. <laughs> the struggle was nothing like as bloody as its predecessor, so people kid themselves, because we had better generals who understood that our soldiers should not be allowed to become futile sacrifices, as they did in 1916. The nation still looks back upon 1939-45 as its finest hour. But our ideas about the First World War are much cloudier and indeed rather confused, even among educated people. Few have much idea why Europe exploded, though they may know that a Ruritanian bigwig with an extravagant moustache got shot in Sarajevo. The most widely held belief, shared by some modern novelists and historians, is that the conflict was simply a ghastly mistake for which all the European powers shared blame. It's folly compounded by the brutish incompetence of military commanders. This is what I would characterize as the poet's view, first articulated by the likes of Siegfried Sassoon and Edmund Blunder, though emphatically not Wilfred Owen, who went to his grave in 1918, entirely convinced that the Allied cause was just. Amid the mud and blood, Sassoon and Blunder felt that no cause could be worth the slaughter better to end it on any terms rather than continue to pursue a meaningless victory. Today, some British people feel almost embarrassed that we finished up on the winning side. Some of those involved in organizing this year's commemorations seem eager to make discussion of the cause for which the struggle was fought as vague as possible to make the theme of this year regret and even apology. Tristram Hunt urges that we should simply use the occasion to celebrate the peace Europe shares today and, by implication, renounce any attempt to explain how war came about in 1914. Uh, tonight, I shall suggest you a rather different view, which is shared by some of the best historians of the period, Hugh Strawn, Michael Howard, Margaret Macmillan, that while the war was assuredly a colossal tragedy, there was a cause at stake. Britain could not credibly have remained neutral while Germany secured hegemony over the continent. Neil Ferguson wrote in perfect seriousness a few years ago that a German victory in World War I would, quote, simply have created something like the European Union half a century earlier. <laughs> that we, the British, could have remained rich and unbloodied bystanders. To some of us, this sounds pretty silly. More serious historians, including some of the best German ones, see the 1914 Kaiserreich as a militarized autocracy whose victory would have been a disaster. Western civilization, I submit, has almost as much reason to be grateful that the Allies prevailed in 1918 as in 1945, despite the appalling cost, and even if the outcome of the first clash proved to have a tragic impermanence, because Germany, this time under Hitler, had to be fought all over again a generation later. I won't tonight detail events in the summer of 1914, but I'll give you a quick precy. On the 28th of June, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, was shot dead by a young Bosnian Serb terrorist, a Habsburg citizen. Terrorism was then as endemic in the Balkans as it is in many parts of the world today. The men in charge of Austria felt no special sorrow for Franz Ferdinand, whom they disliked. But they saw in the outrage an ideal pretext for settling accounts with Serbia, a chronically troublesome neighbor whose leaders incited their own minorities to revolt. Some Serbian army officers had provided the weapons and perhaps also the, the, um, the impetus for the assassination plot though I personally believe it is unlikely the Belgrade government was involved. One aspect of 1914 seems to our generation incomprehensible. Most European nations regarded war not as the supreme horror to be avoided at all costs, but as a usable instrument of policy. 
Many interpretations of how the conflict came about are possible. But the only one that seems to me completely untenable is that it was accidental. Every government believed that it acted rationally in pursuit of its national interests. Austria decided in the first days of July to invade and then break up Serbia because everybody knew that Russia regarded this Slavic nation as under the Tsar's protection. Vienna dispatched an envoy to Berlin to ensure German backing if the Russians interfered. On the 6th of July, Kaiser Wilhelm and his chancellor gave the Austrians what historians call the blank check, an unqualified promise of German diplomatic and, if necessary, military support for crushing Serbia. This was incredibly reckless. Some modern historians have produced elaborate arguments to deflect blame from Germany for what followed. But it seems to me impossible to escape this undisputed fact. The Kaiser's government endorsed Austria's decision to unleash a Balkan war, and this predated everything the Entente Allies did. Some serious historians, including several German ones, suggest that the Kaiser's regime intended from the beginning of the crisis to precipitate a general European conflict. I don't buy that. In July 1914, I think the Germans wanted their Austrian ally to crush Serbia without anybody else getting involved. They sought only a local war. But they were incredibly willing to accept the risk that a general European conflagration would follow. Germany was ruled not quite as an absolute monarchy like the Tsar's Russia, but as an autocracy in which a partially unhinged emperor loved to posture while his generals planned from the premise that war had served Prussia well with three great victories in the previous half century against Denmark, Austria and France. They also recognized that democracy threatened their control of their own country. There was now a socialist majority in the German parliament, which was vehemently opposed to militarism, um, which promised soon to end the Kaiser's dysfunctional personal rule. More than a few conservative politicians and soldiers in Germany believed that a triumph abroad could halt the advance of the socialist tide. They also made a mistake typical of their age. They underrated the dominance their country was achieving through its industrial prowess without firing a shot on any battlefield. Germany was powering ahead of Britain, France, Russia by every economic indicator. The supreme irony of 1914 to me is that if Germany had not gone to war, I can think of nothing that could have prevented Germany from completely dominating Europe within a generation by entirely peaceful economic means. But the Kaiser and his generals measured strength by counting soldiers. They were fixated by Russia's growing military might. Their calculations showed that as early as 1916, the Russians would achieve a decisive advantage. It was this prospect that caused Moltke, Germany's army chief of staff, to growl at a secret strategy meeting in December 1912, chaired by the Kaiser. War! And the sooner the better! In 1914, the Germans were confident that they could achieve victory over Russia and its ally, France. They discounted Britain, third party in the Entente, because its army was tiny, and as the Kaiser cleverly remarked, dreadnoughts have no wheels. When, in late July 1914, the Russians made plain that they would not stand by and watch while the Austrians crushed Serbia, the Germans did three things which provide further circumstantial evidence of their irresponsibility, if nothing worse. They started jamming wireless communications between St. Petersburg and Paris. They persistently lied to every European government, denying advanced knowledge of the contents of Austria's ultimatum to Serbia, and claiming, quite falsely, that their ally had no designs for territorial gains at the expense of a defeated Serbia. And finally, they rejected out of hand a British proposal to address the Balkan crisis through a great power conference because they recognized this would be bound to condemn Austria-Hungary. None of these, it seems to me, were the actions of a nation that wanted a peaceful diplomatic outcome. 
The Austrians duly declared war on Serbia on the 28th of July and started bombarding Belgrade. The Russians mobilized three days later. Apologists for Germany point out that the Tsar's army thus moved before the Kaisers did, but the Russian government saw no choice. The vast distances of their country meant that it must take longer for their forces to concentrate. They were terrified the Germans would literally steal a march on them. There is an argument which some historians whom I respect advance and which we must acknowledge, that the Russians ought to have left the Austrians to crush Serbia rather than widen the conflict, but I'm personally not convinced by it. A bizarre triumphalism overtook Berlin's corridors of power on the 31st of July. The regime had achieved its foremost aim. Germany could appear to its own people as well as to the world as a victim responding to a Russian military initiative. After the Kaiser signed Germany's mobilization order at his Berlin palace, with his unfailing instinct for the wrong gesture, he ordered champagne to be served to his suite. A Bavarian general who visited the war ministry soon after news came of Russian mobilization noted, everywhere, beaming faces, people shaking hands in the corridors, congratulating one another. Russia had acted in an accordance with the avowed hopes of Germany's military leadership. The Kaiser's generals now merely expressed fears that France might decline to follow suit. Wilhelm despised the French as a feminine race not manly like the Anglo-Saxons or Teutons. And this influenced his lack of apprehension about fighting them. The French knew that the German war plan required a swift, smashing defeat of their own army before turning on Russia. Sure enough, Berlin sent a message to Paris saying that unless France surrendered its frontier fortresses to Germany as a guarantee, its neutrality would not be accepted. Instead, and inevitably, the French mobilized. As for Britain, even at this very late hour, most of its government and people opposed involvement in Europe's war. They had no sympathy for either Serbia or Russia. Some, instead, had a real fellow feeling towards Germany and its culture. In July, old lady Londesborough, the first Duke of Wellington's great niece, told Osbert Sitwell in a fashion that echoed widespread sentiment, it's not the Germans but the French that I'm frightened of. <clears throat> but then, suddenly, everything changed. Germany blundered. Its war plan demanded an assault on France through Belgium, of whose neutrality Britain was a guarantor. Berlin formally notified London of its intention to invade. Bismarck and his generation of Prussian warlords had avoided doing this precisely because they feared the consequences. But in 1914, Moltke was so sure Britain was coming into the war anyway that he decided that marching through Belgium would change nothing. He could not have been more wrong. That decision caused the British government to send an ultimatum to Germany, committing the country to fight unless the invaders drew back, as of course they did not. It's sometimes said that Belgian neutrality was just a pretext rather than a real reason for Britain joining the conflict. I don't agree. Although Herbert Asquith, the Prime Minister, Edward Grey, the Foreign Secretary, Winston Churchill, First Lord of the Admiralty, wanted to back France to preserve the European balance of power, most of their own Liberal Party was vehemently opposed until the Germans invaded Belgium. On the 4th of August, Britain became the last major European power to enter the struggle. The most serious charges leveled by some historians against the Asquith government and explicitly against Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Grey is that before 1914 they pursued secret policies which committed Britain unnecessarily to support the French and Russians in a war. Other critics say that even if Grey was right, to acknowledge a likelihood that Britain would be unable to stay neutral in the event of a European war because German hegemony on the continent would represent an intolerable outcome, the government failed to take the essential consequent step to participate in such a struggle to create a big army. But this was, of course, because the British people regarded the navy as their sure shield. 
Raising an army to fight on the continent would have been completely unacceptable. But while this attitude can be branded irrational, it can hardly be described as warmongering. In considering what happened in 1914, I'm driven back again and again to a simple truth. Scarcely any decent historian thinks the British, the French, or even the Russians wanted a European conflict. The Germans, on the other hand, though they did not want the big war they got, certainly willed a Balkan one which led to everything else and which they could have prevented at any moment during July by telling the Austrians to stop. No one nation deserves to bear all the blame for the disaster that unfolded in 1914, but that is why the Germans seem to me most blameworthy. What followed in the ensuing four years was so appalling for mankind that some people suggest that Germany's triumph would have been a lesser evil. But the Kaiserreich's record abroad was barbarous even by contemporary standards. Berlin mandated in advance and applauded after the event the 1904-7 genocide of the Herero and Namaqua peoples of German Southwest Africa, an enormity well beyond the scope of any British colonial misdeed and responsible for 100,000 deaths. Though some German socialists denounced the slaughter, the Kaiser decorated the senior officers who carried it out. During the Germans' 1914 invasion of Belgium and France, their army committed systematic massacres of 6,400 perfectly innocent civilians, about which I'll settle more in a moment. A few historians argue that Britain could have remained neutral in 1914 and prospered mightily by doing so. But the dominating instincts of Germany's leadership would hardly have been moderated by the victory that would almost certainly have been the result of British neutrality. The Kaiser's regime didn't go to war with a grand plan for world domination, but its leaders quickly identified massive rewards as their price for granting an armistice to the Allies. On the 9th of September 1914, when Berlin believed that it saw victory looming, Germany's Chancellor drafted a shopping list. France was to surrender to Germany its entire iron ore deposits, the frontier region of Belfort, a coastal strip from Dunkirk to Boulogne, which was to be colonised by German veterans, the western slopes of the Vosges Mountains. Her strategic fortresses would be demolished and huge cash reparations paid. Luxembourg would be annexed outright to Germany, Belgium and Holland transformed into vassal states, Russia's borders drastically shrunken, a vast colonial empire created in Central Africa, together with a German economic union extending from Scandinavia to Turkey. While other German leaders proposed different demands, some of them even more draconian, all took it for granted that they should not stop fighting until their nation had secured its hegemony over Europe. Had the Kaiser right vanquished its only important continental rivals, it seems fantastic to imagine that its rulers would afterwards have offered a generous accommodation to a neutral Great Britain or acquiesced in a global status quo still dominated by the Royal Navy and British financial interests. Machiavelli observed that wars begin when you will but do not end when you please. Could any responsible British or French government between 1914 and 18 have granted such a peace as Germany sought? It remains hard to see how Allied statesmen could have extracted themselves once the struggle began until there was a decision on the battlefield. The so-called poet's view that the merits of the Anglo-Saxon cause became meaningless amid the horrors of the struggle and brutish incompetence of commanders has been allowed drastically to distort modern perceptions. Many veterans in their lifetimes deplored the notion that Siegfried Sassoon spoke for their generation. One revisionist was an old soldier named Henry Mellish. He wrote in 1978 that he utterly rejected the notion that, quote, the war was one vast, useless, futile tragedy worthy to be remembered only as a pitiable mistake. Instead, said Mellish, I and my like entered the war expecting a heroic adventure and believing implicitly in the rightness of our cause. We ended 
greatly disillusioned as to the nature of the adventure, but still believing that our cause was right and we had not fought in vain. Whether or not a modern reader endorses Mellish's view, it was much more widely held by his contemporaries than the futility vision of Sassoon and his kin, none of whom ever sketched a diplomatic route by which the nightmare they so vividly depicted might be ended. Almost every sane combatant recoiled from the miseries of the battlefield, but this didn't mean they thought that their country should acquiesce in the triumph of their enemies. George Orwell wrote with his accustomed insight 30 years later that the only way to end a war quickly is to lose it. <coughs> in every belligerent nation in August 1914, a few romantics and nationalists, most of them young, enthused about the vast drama unfolding, among them an Austrian housewife who wrote lyrically in her diary about the grandeur of the times, the superb spectacle of the world bursting into flames. But most of Europe succumbed to horrified dismay. In one rustic community of the Zaire in France, two police automobiles carried the mobilization order to the church square at 4.30 on the afternoon of the 1st of August. Immediately, the local bell ringer summoned the population and the village teacher described the effect. It seemed that suddenly the old feudal toxin had returned to haunt us. Nobody spoke for a long while. Some were out of breath, others dumb with shock. Many still carried pitchforks in their hands. The women asked, what can it mean? What's going to happen to us? Wives, children, husbands, all were overcome by anguish and emotion. The wives clung to the arms of their husbands. The children, seeing their mothers weeping, started to cry too. Most of the men resorted to the cafe to discuss the practical issue of how the harvest was to be got in. And then the young and the not so young boarded their trains and went to join the armies. Winston Churchill wrote, after it was all over, no part of the Great War compares in interest with its opening. The measured, silent drawing together of gigantic forces, the uncertainty of their movements and positions, the number of unknown and unknowable facts made the first collision a drama never surpassed. Nor was there any other period in the war when the general battle was waged on so great a scale, when the slaughter was so swift or the stakes so high. Moreover, in the beginning, our faculties of wonder, horror and excitement had not been cauterized and deadened by the furnace fires of years. All this was so, though few of Churchill's fellow participants regarded those vast events with such eager appetite. Many British people were at first uncertain whether they had entered the war on the right side. But opinions hardened when reports emerged about the conduct of the German invaders of Belgium. Yes, some of the stories of thousands of babies systematically maimed were fictions, mere crude propaganda. But the most modern scholarly research shows that beyond burning Louvain, several other towns and many villages, the Germans shot in cold blood as hostages or in alleged reprisals 6,400 perfectly innocent uh, Belgian and French civilians of all ages and both sexes. One among many German diarists, an officer named Count Kessler, wrote on the 22nd of August, the inhabitants of Ciel attacked our pioneers building a bridge across the Meuse, killing 20 of them. As a punishment, approximately 200 citizens were court-martialed and shot. The story of the attacks was a fantasy, but the executions were cold fact. It's unnecessary to persist in detailing such episodes. The latest research catalogues 129 major atrocities during the first weeks of the war. A grand total of 6,427 civilians known to have been deliberately killed by the German army during its 1914 operations. It's mistaken to compare the Kaiser's regime directly to that of the Nazis a generation later. But its conduct in 1914 scarcely suggests that its victory would have been a triumph for European civilization. As for the way the war was fought once it started, almost every modern scholar 
agrees that it's an illusion to imagine there was ever an easy path towards winning it, even if commanders of Napoleonic gifts had led the armies. In any struggle between great 20th century industrial nations, an enormous amount of dying and killing had to happen before one side or the other prevailed. What distinguished the Second World War from the First was not that Britain had better or more humane commanders in the later conflict, but that between 1941 and 45, the Russians accepted almost all the sacrifice necessary to beat the Nazis. 27 million dead, and they were responsible for 92% of the German army's total war loss. Although, heaven knows, it didn't seem so to those who were around at the time, the Western Allies paid only a small fraction of the blood price for winning World War II. By contrast, in 1914-18, the British and French peoples paid a much heavier forfeit, double that of 1939-45 for us, treble for France. But it's a British conceit to imagine that we bore the brunt of the horrors. The Russians and Serbs accepted by far the heaviest casualties. Serbia lost a million dead, Russia at least twice that. It's a myth that the conflict's bloodiest event was the 1st of July 1916, first day of the Somme. In the early weeks of the war, battles were fought utterly unlike those that came later, indeed more like the clashes of Napoleon's era than of the 20th century, although much more costly in lives. In August 1914, Britain suffered 12,500 casualties. France, more than a quarter of a million. Every nation launched almost immediate offensives, except the British, whose little expeditionary force was still in transit when the armies of France first clashed with those of Germany. The most costly single day of the entire 1914-18 conflict was the 22nd of August, when the French lost 27,000 dead. Many people associate 1914-18 with mud, trenches, wire, tin hats. But those early battles weren't remotely like that. In the late summer of 1914, France's army advanced to the attack across virgin countryside wearing red trousers and blue overcoats, led by bands playing, yes, bands, flags flying, officers mounted on chargers wearing white gloves, waving swords. In one clash, on the morning of the 22nd of August, in thick fog, French columns marched north through the village of Vierton, just inside Belgium. Cavalry, trotting ahead, approached a farm atop a steep hill and met heavy German fire. A day of blood and chaos ensued. The Germans started to advance, ordered by their officers to identify themselves to each other in the murk by singing national songs. Their opponents likewise struck up the Marseillaise, and this proved the last tune that many of the choristers ever sang. Suddenly, dramatically, the mist lifted. The French infantry, cavalry, artillery batteries found themselves exposed in full view of German gunners on the ridge above, and the slaughter followed. French infantry <laughs> tried to renew their advance uphill in short rushes. Their field service regulations assumed that in 20 seconds, an attacker could run 50 yards before his enemy could reload his rifle. They were wrong. A survivor of Vietnam observed bitterly, the people who wrote those regulations had simply forgotten the existence of such things as machine guns. We could distinctly hear two of those copy grinders at work. Every time our men got up to advance, the line got thinner. Finally, our captain gave the order, fix bayonets and charge. It was midday by now and devilish hot. Our men, in full kit, started running heavily up that grassy slope, drums beating, bugles sounding the charge. We were all shot down. I was hit and lay there till I was picked up later. That evening, a survivor, stunned by his experiences, stood motionless, muttering again and again, moan down, ah, moan down. <laughs> Further north, on that same dreadful 22nd of August, another French force advanced up a forest road in the Ardennes. This was the elite third colonial infantry division. Its units advanced in column up a narrow road into a forest called Onlier. 
The French had not reconnoitered. Horse, foot, and guns simply marched into the woodland led by the Chasseurs d'Afrique. They met German troops advancing in the opposite direction. They were hastily deployed among the trees. And then as the French launched a series of frontal assaults, the Germans unleashed a torrent of fire, which in the course of that day shattered the formation. By afternoon, the French in the woods and beyond found themselves surrounded and harrowed by fire. Horses, men, carts, and guns milled in chaos until the lucky ones contrived to surrender. On the 22nd of August, that one division lost 228 officers, 10,272 other ranks, including 3,800 made prisoner. In 1918, a memorial was erected on the site, which you can still see there, by the father of one of the dead, a young officer named Lieutenant Paul Fanet. The grieving parent never forgave himself because he'd responded to his son's pre-war sowing of wild oats by insisting that he should join the Chasseurs d'Afrique to sort him out. In such a fashion, in a dozen battles along the frontiers of France, did 27,000 young Frenchmen perish on the 22nd of August without gaining a yard of ground. The French general who directed the assault in the Ardennes wrote laconically to Joffre, the commander-in-chief, on the whole, results hardly satisfactory. Next day, the British endured their own first little action on the canal at Mons, just inside Belgium. They fought gallantly enough, but heavily outnumbered. They had no choice but to retreat that night. Three days later, at Le Cateau, they staged another rearguard action which resembled a battle out of the Napoleonic Wars. Nobody had trenches. The Germans advanced across stooped cornfields against British infantry and artillery deployed in full view to meet them. The slaughter was nothing like as severe as the French had faced, but British losses at Le Cateau were about as heavy as they suffered a war later on the 6th of June 1944, D-Day in Normandy. And Germans found that when they did the attacking, they suffered just as heavily as their enemies. Then the British and French alike found themselves retreating, retreating southwards across France towards Paris under a blazing sun and occasional thunderstorms in the face of apparently invincible German masses. In the last days of August, it seemed overwhelmingly likely, not least to the Kaiser and his generals, that Germany was on the brink of absolute triumph. It wasn't easy for the Allied armies to hold together amid a retreat that threatened to become a rout. Straggling and desertion became big problems. On the evening of the 27th of August, a British cavalry officer rode into the town of St. Quentin and was shocked to find there two battalions of British infantry lying exhausted, simply waiting to be taken prisoner by the Germans. Incredibly, the colonels of the Warwickshires and Dublin Fusiliers had given the town's mayor a written undertaking of surrender to be presented to the enemy to spare San Quentin from a battle. Major Tom Bridges, the cavalry officer, hastily retrieved this damning piece of paper and somehow herded the infantrymen back onto their feet, shuffling along the road to join the army. But three weeks later, the two colonels were cashiered for, quote, conduct unbecoming officers and gentlemen. One of them, John Elkington of the Warwicks, aged 49, responded like a figure out of romantic fiction by enlisting in the French Foreign Legion, with which he was badly wounded and won a croix de guerre and médaille militaire. In 1916, King George V pardoned Elkington <coughs> and awarded him a DSO in recognition of his extraordinary gallantry in pursuing rehabilitation. Humbler soldiers who cracked suffered even harsher fates. Both the British and French resorted to drastic sanctions against those who decided it was all too much for them. One such was Private Thomas Highgate of the Royal West Kent. <coughs> On the afternoon of the 6th of September, the day that the French launched their huge counteroffensive on the Marne, which threw back the Germans from the gates of Paris and changed the face of the war. An English gamekeeper on a Rothschild estate south of the capital surprised Highgate in a shed. 
the soldier had made a personal decision that the Battle of the Marne wasn't for him, and he was wearing stolen civilian clothes, which damned him. Highgate was shot by firing squad on the 8th of September, a ceremony watched by two companies of his comrades following an order from the corps commander. That officer said he wanted the execution to have the maximum deterrent effect, and his orders to the provost marshal specified that Highgate should be killed, quote, as publicly as possible. And so he was. Today, such punishments are thought to have been barbaric, and victims receive posthumous pardons from the British government. But to me, this is a moral conceit, to pretend that we can retrospectively impose on our forefathers the more humane values of the 21st century. What would you have done if you'd been a British or French general fighting a struggle for national survival and leading an army in danger of collapse? What's sometimes forgotten is that men who run away in wars deserve our sympathy, but they also put at risk a host of their mates who must do double duty and often make double sacrifice to compensate for those who flinch. I won't be so cruel as to say that Thomas Highgate and his kin deserve their fate, but I will say that if I'd been a commander in that distant era, I might have made the same decision on the 8th of September 1914. If soldiers had believed there was an acceptable way to get out of that ghastly clash of arms, who would not have taken it? I've written a good deal about the predicament of women. Um, as the war developed, um, they played an increasingly vital and central part in their societies, which completely changed uh, the status of women in many parts of the world. Uh, but in the early months of the war, their role was grotesquely constricted. Some female patriots decided that if insufficient young men were volunteering for military service, women could do their bit by shaming them into doing so. Uh, one young man named Bernard Hamley was playing golf with a friend on Wimbledon Common and just congratulating himself on a good tee shot when two girls came out of the nearby clubhouse. And one said sharply, that was a good shot, wasn't it? I hope you will be making as good a shot against the Germans before presenting both players with white feathers. Um, the young men then identified themselves as officers of the Rifle Brigade on embarkation leave. Um, Hamley told me in 1963, the young females were somewhat crestfallen and made some inadequate excuses. But many women across Europe felt a profound sense of frustration that while their menfolk were on the battlefield, their own contribution was initially confined to making socks. Knitting for soldiers became almost a sacred duty, but the fruits of their labors were sometimes cynically received. Corporal Egon Kitsch catalogued a consignment which reached his Austrian unit in Serbia in November. Warm underwear, of course only knitted nonsense, <laughs> neatly embroidered gloves, wristlets with a heart stitched in red, mittens to fit baby elephants, <laughs> knee pads for storks. Corporal Kitsch was grudgingly grateful, but he said he preferred cigarettes. <laughs> that genteel British magazine, The Lady, strove to help women address unexpected social problems thrown up by the war. In its daily difficulty column on the 10th of December 1914, it raised the dilemma facing a cat-owning woman who houses a dog for an officer who's gone to the front. When the dog starts killing her cats, what should she do? <laughs> <laughs> the lady asserted authoritatively that she had a responsibility to ensure that the dog was properly quartered, but she might reasonably look for another home for it. I've ended my narrative of 1914 with the story of the first Battle of Ypres in October and November. In the western corner of Belgium, the British held the line against huge and apparently endless German attacks at the cost of leaving most of their men, the old sweats of the British Expeditionary Force, the professional army, to repose forever in local cemeteries. The British victory at Ypres, for victory it was, frustrated the Germans' last attempt to achieve a war-winning breakthrough in the West in 1914. But it was purchased at such cost in suffering and sacrifice that no one felt like celebrating. Ypres was the first true trench battle of the war, fought amid mud and blood and sometimes waist-high water. Those who took part found it impossible to imagine that such a struggle could continue for many more weeks, far less four years. <laughs>
We're today sometimes tempted to look on those words, rest in peace, carved on so many gravestones, as a mere cliché. But to those who experienced Ypres and all the ghastly battles that followed, those words had a real and profound meaning. A Grenadier Guards officer wrote about a friend and comrade killed in November. When I think of poor Bernard's utter weariness, I left him in his trench in the early morning and wished I could take his place. He was so done. I think of him now at peace, away from all this noise and misery. And though it must be terrible for his wife, poor thing, it can't be bad for him. I must comfort her to know he can rest at last. Words of that sort had a profound meaning for millions of men who experienced the horrors of France and Flanders. Let me finish where I started by emphasizing my own belief that while the First World War was an unspeakable catastrophe for Europe and for all those who had to fight it, it's mistaken also to consider it, from a British perspective, to have been futile. A wise historian, Kenneth Morgan, who is neither a conservative nor a revisionist, delivered a powerful 1996 lecture about the cultural legacy of the two world wars in which he argued, quote, that the history of the first was hijacked in the 1920s by the critics, much influenced by the economist Maynard Keynes, an impassioned German sympathizer who castigated the alleged injustice of the 1919 Versailles Treaty. But Keynes did not for a moment consider the draconian peace which a victorious Germany would have imposed and did impose on a defeated Russia in 1917. The contrast is striking and seems to me wildly overdone between the triumphalism of the British people about World War II and their revulsion about World War I. In the summer of 1918, Britain belatedly achieved a great victory on the Western Front, becoming the chief instrument of the armistice Germany was obliged to accept in November. No sane person could suggest that this year, 2014, should become an occasion for celebration of the conflict or indeed of that victory. But I should like to hope that our politicians and the media will break free from the weary, sterile, futility cliches and acknowledge that Britain played a necessary part in the Great War. Our participation was rewarded by only a few worthless new colonies together with financial ruin. But 1914 Germany, as ruled by the Kaiser and his generals, represented a malign force whose triumph had to be frustrated. More than 700,000 British servicemen, 4,000 from this very city, who perished between 1914 and 18, did not die for nothing. All deaths in all wars are just cause for lamentation. But the only credible alternative to the huge sacrifice made by the Allies was that forces of tyranny prevailed. Thank you all very much. Right, ladies and gentlemen, a very thought-provoking paper, I'm sure you'll agree, dealing with the, the, the role of the very com various combatant nations in 1914 and the way the war was waged in that, uh, that first year of the conflict. Could we invite questions from the floor? We've got a couple of roving mics. Um, could you put your, take this gentleman here? Good evening. Good evening. How important is it to consider Germany's actions in the context of a previous uh, century of colonialism and imperialism by other European powers? If I was um, a German here tonight and I was making the case uh, for Germany, it would be very much on the lines you've implicitly just suggested. Um, I would have said, ah, but of course you, the British, uh, wanted the status quo to continue because uh, you had all the empire you wanted. Here were we newly come. Um, that I was speaking the other day to um, an audience of Chinese generals and they asked whether there were any parallels between, um, between uh, um, today and 1914 and I said up to a point 
that there is a parallel, that um, here we have China as a great new rising power in the world, and China wants its place in the sun, and China is no longer willing to accept, let us say, that the Pacific is an American ocean and so on. So there is a case there, in there somewhere, but on the other hand, if you come to the question, what I did say to the Chinese the other day, I said, all of us have the most profound respect for what your country has achieved and, has, and is achieving, but we beg you to learn the lesson from Germany, which could have been uh, one of, if not the dominant power in Europe or the world, if it had not gone to war. Um, and in the end, what damned the Germans, in my eyes anyway, was the fact that they, that they went to war not the fact uh, that uh, they wanted some share of the places in the sun that others had already. Um, but, yeah, the, the, there, is a, there is a German case which has to be somewhere in what you've just suggested. Can we take the gentleman in the front here? It's very interesting that the First World War is perhaps the only war where, in Britain at least, the poets had the last word. They trumped the generals, they trumped uh, the journalists, they trumped um, in the public's mind almost everybody in terms of an interpretation of the war. Do you think, however, that the poet's view may have been more of a micro view rather than a macro view as the purposes of the war, and it's the later interpretation of the, by the public, and also during the war, whenever the concept arose of a war to end all war, that in a way implied the poet's view anyway, this in, is, in a um, macro type. This is um, one of the interesting things, is to try to identify at what point sentiment turned against the war. And most of the men who returned from France in 1918 did not feel any of the revulsion against the generals, or and they felt revulsion against what they'd experienced. But a million people turned out for Haig's funeral, and nearly as many uh, for the procession in Edinburgh that followed. Um, it was around 1930 that people looked at, um, at, um, at what the state of the world, and especially of Europe, and looked over their shoulders and said, what has it all been for? And part of the trouble was that politicians, and especially Lloyd George, had made such fantastically extravagant promises about the new world that was going to come out of this, the moral regeneration for Britain, which had not come about. And I personally believe um, that I think one thing very important in attitudes, British, British attitude, not global attitude, but British attitude, um, in 1945, um, that the soldiers returning from the war came back to a Labour government that was committed to the creation of a welfare state that although things were very tough for some years after the war, it was obvious to most people that some of the things they'd gone into the war for had, were coming out of it. In 1918, the soldiers who came back to the war came back to find the same people still in charge, and not much had changed. Um, one sort of uh, point bears making, sort of um, half-related, one thing that interests me enormously is that um, among historians, um, there are sort of almost two parallel arguments. One is about how far Germany was to blame for the war, and the other um, is about whether Britain had to get involved. And the other day I took part in a debate in London, and I was asked by the, I was taking the view that Britain did have to get involved, and uh, for those of you who aren't aware of it, Christopher Clark, a very good historian, wrote a good book called The Sleepwalkers, in which he is inclined to find others than the Germans. Um, and especially the Russians, blameworthy for the original of the war. And I suggested to the organizers of the debate, they said, who should we get on the other side? And I said, Christopher Clark. And I was very surprised when they came back to me. And they said, he won't do it. If he was taking part in the debate, he said he'd be on your side. Because although he thinks, that although he thinks he does not share my view about the overwhelming responsibility of Germany, he did believe that once there was going to be a continental war, the British um, couldn't stay out. And although they are sort of almost, not exactly, but they're related arguments, obviously, but there are separate strands. Could we take another question from in here and then we'll take one from one of the Overthill Lecture Theatres? Yeah. Um, I was wondering what you think about the whole um, lions led by donkeys kind of analysis because it seems to me that there might... Maybe what you're saying is right, and Britain had to get involved in everything, but surely there's some blame to be had for German 
um, generals that allowed these <coughs> atrocities that, you, that have happened and British generals that have allowed people to be used as cannon um, fodder and the two, system two, that two, put two, those well, people Well, the first thing to be said is, have you brought sleeping bags? Because um, <laughs> this is a very long subject. Um, but it's worth remembering that Alan Clark, who called his book The Donkeys, Alan Clark afterwards admitted he'd invented the quote he attributed to the Kaiser about <laughs> lands lived by donkeys. Um, the phrase had been around, but um, the point is that um, people find it very hard to understand that, uh, that they think the First World War was the, the worst war in history, and they think the generals were uniquely incompetent. Well, um, quantitatively, of course, it was the worst war in history so far, um, but qualitatively, the idea that it was actually a worse experience than, let's say, one has to remember that uh, Napoleon, in his, uh, when he went into Russia, um, lost more people than the British lost in the First World War. And for some peculiar reason, the French today don't think any worse of him for having done so. Um, but um, the idea of the generals, they were not very admirable or lovable human beings, the generals. But no general on either side found a formula to overcome this huge problem um, about when you've got great industrial nations up against each other. The defence was much stronger, the technology of the day, than the offence. And no, I don't think they were as bad as they were painted. Uh, it is worth remembering that in the Second World War, much worse things than loose or the Somme or Passchendaele happened, much bloodier things. But they happened on the Eastern Front. They happened to the Russians and not to us. And so this business, what I'm pleading for this centenary year, is not that we should all suddenly learn to love Haig, who was indeed pretty unlovable but a bit more context and perspective to try and see things other than in just caricatures. Uh, this is a question, Max, from one of yeah. the local theatres. It picks up on what you said earlier about commemoration and celebration. Yeah. It's by Irene Shearer, who's one of the teachers, a teacher in Dundee. Mm. If you had 50 words, we won't necessarily limit you to 50 words, but 50 words to explain the commemoration of World War I to primary school children today, what would they be? <laughs> Not putting you on the spot or anything at all, you know. It's, um... Well, after what I said earlier about, about sleeping bags, I think tents will be needed as well in this case. Um, that um, there are some things I notice very much these days. We are living in a more and more risk averse, peace orientated society, which is a very good thing. We are the fact the world is becoming less violent, not that it looks that way and that even uh, within, uh, within the British Isles there is less violence, all this is a very good thing. But on the other hand, I think it's always dangerous to try and impose retrospectively the values. I meet a lot of young who doubt whether any cause is worth a war. Um, they find the idea of going to war, and especially, of course, influenced by two disastrous, admittedly much smaller wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And it's totally understandable they should feel that way. But, and I hope not only because I've now got to the age of being in the sort of boring old farts generation, <laughs> um, that I do hope, I do believe that one must make the case that sometimes in history, moment, there have been many, many bad wars in history, a lot of wars which are not all good and not all bad, but there are times when societies have to be prepared to fight. And I would certainly say that Britain, like most countries, has fought more bad wars than good ones over its, over its long history. Um, but I do not believe either the Second World War, because we had to ally ourselves with the Soviet Union, um, was not quite such a good thing as we sometimes like to think. And the First World War, I think, wasn't quite such a... I say again and again, I believe that if, if the Kaiser's um, Germany had won, um, Europe would have paid a terrible forfeit. Judging by the, the level of interest, I think we've got time maybe for one or two more questions. Um, the, the, the gentleman there, sorry, stand up for... Thank you. So, Max, you said you described in your talk the, the attitudes of the various great powers in 1914, but is there not an element of bad luck starting the war as well? The, um, the Archduke going the wrong way in, in Serbia, the French president and premier being essentially incommunicado on their battleship returning to France for a week or so. It, while there may have been the powder keg, it, was it circumstances as well as attitudes that led us to the, the start of the war in uh, summer of 14? The worst luck in 1914, one of the popular proverbs that's least founded in reality is that one that says, cometh the hour, cometh the man. Um, very often in human affairs, occasionally um, in history, uh, such as um, Pitt uh, in the, at, the, the end of the at the end of the 18th century, and Churchill in 1940. Sometimes, when a great crisis comes, 
a great man does emerge. But more often when a great crisis comes, um, some very, very moderate people end up responding to it. I mean, you've only got to see it very striking. You look at the Euro crisis, um, and what has happened. Now, fortunately, that's only been about mere money rather than about... But the staggering incompetence of the leaders of Europe and the way they've handled the, uh, the, uh, the Euro crisis, uh, in the same way in 1914, the leaders of Europe um, were a very undistinguished group of people, whether the crowned heads or uh, the leaders. They, uh, but that is usually the way things are. Yes, you can certainly say um, that a more enlightened and abler group of statesmen, of course they should have been able to find a way out in 1914, but they were pretty much the sort of, um, dare I say it, sort of John Major school of statesmanship um, uh, that, um, that often ends up in charge at these moments. So I think that was the bad luck. But the other thing I think we should say, which is very important, nothing is inevitable. I mean, people say, if the Archduke hadn't been shot, would there have been a war? Um, well, you can't, I, I don't really believe in counterfactuals, because as the great Sir Michael Howard, the historian, not uh, what I call the good Michael Howard, not the bad Michael Howard, <laughs> um, um, that, uh, Michael Howard always says, once you move one variable, so many other alternative outcomes become possible. But I never forgot, I was born at the end of 1945, and my father wrote me a letter at the end of 1945, which he gave me when I was 21, when I was three days after I was born. Um, about the world as it then looked to him. And he and most of his generation at the end of 1945 thought it was overwhelmingly likely that within my lifetime there'd be a war between the Soviet Union and the West. And it didn't happen. Now, of course, we know that part of the reason was to do with nuclear weapons. But actually, to people in 1945, it seemed more likely that there would be a great war between the Soviet Union and the West than it did to anybody in 1914. So we have to say, no course of events in history is inevitable. There's nothing inevitable. It's... Uh, it's um, but people, generally, history is the story of not very great men um, blundering their way through um, great events. Sorry, ladies and gents. So on that note, I think we'll have to, to, to end the questions. Um, thanks very much, Max. And it calls to me to, uh, to call on Keith Winter, the convener of the Graduates Council Business Committee, to come and give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Keith. Uh, thank you, Lord Provost, Principal, Sir Max, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to stand here as the Chairperson of the Business Committee and give the vote of thanks. Before I come to speak to about Sir Max, a couple of other thank yous. Thanks first to the University staff who have laid on tonight and accommodated everyone both here and our friends who are in the overspill area to accommodate the demand that has been met by the opportunity to hear Sir Max speak tonight. Also to uh, Professor Peter Downs, the University for continuing the free lecture series of which this forms part and is, is a real boon to people in Dundee and to give the chance to attend and hear the quality of the speakers, as we've heard tonight. Everyone after this is cordially invited down to the drinks reception, which has been hosted by the Lord Provost and the City Council, for which we are grateful as a business committee, where you can mingle and have the opportunity to purchase a copy of Catastrophe. So now we turn to our speaker. Tonight we've been entertained and informed uh, by the talk tonight from an eminent speaker and historical commentator, Sir Max Hastings. However, as has been pointed out, this is also a moment for poignant reflection, given the momentous anniversary that we, that we are this year recalling. The commencement of the Great War, the war to end all wars, but sadly, as we all recognise too well, this was not the case, and contemporary events, as in the Ukraine, still touch us. The book, The Events and the Consequences of the Various Actions and Inactions, recounted beautifully and interwoven majestically by Sir Max, are about people and an almost indescribable level of suffering to many. To hear of a statistic of 27,000 casualties in one day by one nation, which is 1,000 more than the 26,000 figure mentioned by Lord Provost of the contribution of citizens of Dundee, really does bring a scale of impact and effect. We heard reference to Dundee's own, the 4th Battalion, the first territorial deployment into the war in Europe, necessitated by the losses incurred at battles such as Ypres in 1914. Lewes is carried by many as Dundee's psalm, or in historical terms, flodden because of the impact, the profound impact it had on the people of the city. The 4th Battalion went to France in February 1915 with 900 men. By the 24th of September, there was only 423 men left fit, and on the following day, further 230 men were killed or wounded, and 19 of the 20 officers, 95%, were wounded or killed. So 190 remained standing on the 26th of September, after eight months. 
a shocking proportion. So from high international political intrigue, major military manoeuvres and application of then modern military techniques, the effects of what could seem a distant and unrelated faraway incident, characterised and mythologised by the death of one man, touched the hearth and hearts of hundreds of Dundonians. We know of the focus and skills of Sir Max as a foremost historian of, this, of his generation at our time. In Catastrophe, he brings together in an intense and comprehensive focus piece the turmoil, international uncertainties, nationalist agendas, strutting individual egos, misplaced state self-satisfaction, and poor policy analysis, and sequence of events in a panoramic insight of reflection and narration around 1914 and what led to events such as those that followed in the subsequent sad and in hum human terms, very costly four years. Sir Max, on behalf of the university and the business committee, could I ask you to come up and accept a small token of our appreciation for such an engagement. <laughs>